And we're going to have the introduction of our speaker by uh, Bob Compton. So Bob. Oh, welcome everyone. Um, I think everybody might agree with me that uh, Oak Ridge uh, owes its existence to mass spectrometry, beginning with separating uranium uh, isotopes from themselves. And uh, last summer we had six speakers speaking on to uh, Oracle, speaking on mass spectrometry in Oak Ridge, and it went over very well. And one of the speakers was Gary, Sp Gary Van Burkle. And our speaker today is Gary Van Burkle, who will speak on mass spectrometry at Oak Ridge, commercial successes. So he's gonna add something to that. <clears throat> <clears throat> Gary earned his BA degree in chemistry from Lawrence Un University in Wisconsin and his PhD in analytical chemistry from Washington State University. He was a discus thrower in college and passed his, his genes, i.e. daughter, <laughs> and expertise to the ORHS track team. Gary was group leader and, and uh, distinguished scientist in the mass spectrometry and laser spectroscopy group at ORNL. His most notable work in the 1990s led to an elucidation of electrochemical aspects of electrospray ionization for which he was awarded the 2005 beam in a Medal by the American Society for Mass Spectrometry. I, I note in parenthesis here that uh, John Finn received the Nobel Prize for electrospray ionization. His graduate career, in his graduate career, and at ORNL, Gary published 178 papers and has been awarded 35 patents. He received the Department of Energy Federal Laboratory Con uh, Consortium Excellence in Technology Transfer Award, three R&D 100 awards, the Binion Award. He received the UT Battelle Distinguished Inventor. ORNL Inventor of the Year and ORNL Director's Award, Scientist of the Year, as well as the ORNL Science Communicator Award. Since retiring, he has founded Van Burkle Ventures, Ventures LLC, an analytical measurement science innovation research consulting and writing firm in Oak Ridge. Welcome, Gary, to our group. All right, thank you very much. Let me see if I can share. I put up anything? Yeah, we see Zoom. Hold on. It says I'm sharing. Got to get out of this. There we go. In close. There we go. How's that? That's it's good. That's looking good. Okay. Well, uh, thanks so much, Herb and Bob. I, I really appreciate this invitation. This is this is quite the task. I'm I'm just small, one small cog in the wheel of, of mass spectrometry that was was at ORNL. And everybody's history history is what it is, but everybody has a different interpretation. I'm going to get a little bit of mine, but kind of more of my perspective on how I got to to where I went. Uh, and just start a little bit with a, a brief history of some of the mass spectrometry and, and uh, how it guided me. And then, then focus on three commercial products that came out of things that, that I invented. And then just talk about, you know, mass spectrometry uh, that I'm doing now, in addition to that, uh, that applies to kind of everyday life and then finish with something uh, a little bit, little bit fun. So I'm gonna talk about a little bit of Oak Ridge history uh, and then my approach to innovative research, which kind of uh, what, what kind of drove me in this particular direction. And, it, and it's more of a necessity thing than anything uh, uh, real strategic uh, that I did. Uh, generic mass spectrometry, just to get us all oriented uh, on what we're talking about, what a mass spectrometer is and what it does. And then these open port sampling interfaces and their commercialization and, and what they can do and the product the problems they're solving right now. Uh, some new ventures uh, talking about uh, ions and air, and then maybe something that's a little more physics involved, but fun. And then uh, some key lessons learned, this, the insight I'd pass on uh, to older and younger generation if, if I had to start over again. Um, and then end with some questions, answering questions. So this is what Bob alluded to, right? Everybody sees this when you come to a museum in Oak Ridge, you see it online, uh, the calutrons, which are preparative mass spectrometers. So you use a magnetic field to separate in space uh, the different isotopes, uh, physically isolate them from one another, and then and you know the outcome of that in, in Oak Ridge. 
When I first came to Oak Ridge, the mass spectrometry group I was in was located at Y12. And it grew out of quality control uh, for mass spectrometry. So if, if you did the Calutron experiment, you needed to know what your enrichment value was. And so you took that to an analytical mass spectrometer that, that could measure that. Similar type things were done at K25 for the enrichment there. So there was mass spectrometers everywhere. There was a lot of, a lot of uh, quality control type things that were done as well as uh, the enrichments itself. So the group I was in grew out of this and was physically located at, at Y12 for that reason. And then Michelle alluded to this and, and Bob talked about the, the uh, Michelle Buchanan from Oak Ridge and then Bob alluded to it in the introduction that last year we had this series of talks that uh, revolved around mass spec uh, at Oak Ridge, and one of the big drivers was Dub Schultz in the analytical chemistry division. And so that group I was in was actually analytical chemistry located at Y12, and it was part of his vision uh, and others to really make drive mass spectrometry forward. It was critical to the war effort, and they realized it could be critical to analytical chemistry and, and sciences in general going forward. So he had a big part in, in pushing uh, mass spectrometry continuing after the war. One thing that wasn't mentioned in our presentations last year was this. When I first came to Oak Ridge, they had been working on a concept out for what I'll call now and what I think would be called now a mass spectrometry research center at ORNL. So the labs were located at Y12. These were already kind of antiquated buildings. You can imagine contamination and whatnot. And they wanted to move it out of Y12 to X10. Um, and many of you will remember that X10, of course, is referred to as a country club. Much nicer environment. Uh, you can get visitors in much easier. So they wanted to move all the mass spectrometry there. And so there was a, a report written. Uh, Dub was on it. Uh, Warner Christie, some of you may know, Joe Carter, who, who headed up uh, mass spectrometry at Oak Ridge for a long time. Uh, wrote this report and they wanted to build this, this mass spectrometry center at X10. When I first came here in 1987, you know, that was fresh in everybody's mind and they started these buildings. Uh, it ended up being scaled down, uh, DOE didn't have enough money, that kind of thing, but they ended up building two buildings, 5510 and 5510A, which housed uh, uh, mass, the, the mass spectrometry uh, at ORNL at that point. And so that's, that was one of the major reasons that I stayed was this vision of mass spectrometry being a world center, uh, uh, ORNL being a world center for mass spectrometry. Well, during this whole time, uh, prior to when I got here and then through the first 10 years or so, a lot of stuff happened. This is a slide that Michelle put together. I've modified uh, a bit. Uh, and you'll see the stuff I have in blue is things that are directly involved in, but over the years post-war, a lot of things happened. So resin bead sampling for thermal MS. This is again, quality control, IAEA type things, looking at enrichment uh, of different isotopes. Uh, coupling electrospray with a quadrupole line trap, that's something I was involved in is, is Bob uh, said that electrospray was the 2002 Nobel prize. Uh, we were the first to put it on quadrupole line traps, and, and those are the instruments used today, electrospray uh, quadrupole line traps for things like proteomics or now metabolomics. Uh, it just created a whole new analytical area of, of work. Direct sampling research, this uh, Mark Wise, uh, Kevin Hart were involved in this, say environmental type work, go out directly to a site, sample there and get immediate results. Uh, atmospheric sampling go discharge was a similar type thing. Scott McClucky and Gary Glish. This was mainly used for explosives type work at the time. So we had built many different type bomb detectors, some that were used at Y12 uh, to screen incoming packages. Uh, secondary ion mass spectrometry and tandem mass spectrometry, secondary ion mass spectrometry. This was uh, Pete Todd uh, did a lot of this work. And this this was kind of the precursor to mass spectrometry imaging, which is a, is a very big area now. So you can look at the spatial distribution of materials in, in planar substrates, say tissues uh, or different materials. Um, and then electrospray was what I worked on, studying uh, the electrochemical aspects of it uh, and, and then other things that made it hum. Uh, and then 
again, Kevin Hart and others, uh, Mark Wise were involved in the chem biomass spectrometry systems. These were deployed with the war fighters out in the field and still are uh, in case there was some kind of uh, camera bio attack. Uh, and then others may remember Mike Ramsey. Uh, uh, he was involved in, in lots of different things, lab on a chip, but he also was working on micro mass spectrometers. And I, I believe the intellectual property for this is licensed to 908 devices. And that's a company that makes handheld mass spectrometers that are used a lot, in, say firefighters, uh, different people out in the field, uh, drug enforcement, also the warfighter. Um, and then what I have more recently worked on the last 20 years or so, I guess, are these liquid introduction surface sampling modalities. What's kind of curious here, if these numbers are right from um, Michelle, there was, there's just over 80 patents issued in mass spectrometry. I, I believe that's got to be a low number. I have 35 of those. And I, I think that's skewed because it really wasn't until the early 2000s that the laboratory supported inventing, commercializing uh, uh, intellectual property. Uh, so before that, it wasn't a really big deal, and it's actually kind of hard to do, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll touch on that. Uh, but anyway, been quite successful, and I think, you know, there's a lot more products to come because there's a lot of this IP, you know, it has at least a 20-year lifetime, so we expect more products to come out. So this is the picture uh, uh, that may have been shown last year. This was out of a 1996 publication, Rapid Communications and Mass Spectrometry. The whole issue of that journal was dedicated to mass spectrometry at Oak Ridge. Uh, this is, there's about 40 or so people that were involved. And so this, this is kind of the, what I'd call the heyday. Again, this is my interpretation of mass spectrometry at Oak Ridge, but this was, we had some of the biggest names in the field here at that particular time. And we're really uh, producing a, a lot of stuff and, and people looked at Oak Ridge as a, as a real, real leader. Uh, mass spectrometry. And you, if you look really hard, you can see Bob right in the back there. <laughs> uh, people like Mike Ramsey, um, Scott McLucky. I happen to be sitting here in the front. Uh, for these to know, there's Michelle Buchanan, there's Kevin Hart. Um, so some of those people are still there. Bob Hedick is still working at the laboratory. Uh, so uh, a big crew, but a lot of them, a lot of them are gone now, time passes. But anyway, that time period really was when we had a kind of the most international influence or respect uh, around the world. Uh, and, and that was lost a little bit. Again, this is just my opinion. Um, and I'm giving you the logical explanation for what I did, what I did later on. Okay, so uh, this vision for a mass spectrometry center at Oak Ridge and really being mass spectrometry being a centerpiece of research at the lab was kind of gone. A part of that is, you know, DOE doesn't like to just promote tools and we can make, explain it in lots of ways, but that's what happened. So a lot of people left uh, for other opportunities. Mass spec just continued to get big. So even today, uh, if you're a mass spectrometrist, you have a job. It's just, it's just really, really big. Um, so there was continued support at the lab. We had continued support in basic energy sciences, uh, also in applied, the biological sciences also had some, uh, but it wasn't really growing. Uh, as you know, for the people that have worked at the lab, without some real solid base support, it's hard to build a program uh, and really thrive. So the question is, if you just have some base support, how are you going to get resources, not just survive, but to thrive? Well, necessity is a mother of invention, and that's how I got into inventing. Right? So this shows kind of um, the synergism involved in the BES, Basic Energy Sciences Program at the laboratory. So from the time I came until the time I retired, we had money from DOE, Basic Energy Sciences, and something called separations and analysis. And we were focused on mass spectrometry. And, and what we were looking at were chemical characterization challenges. What couldn't you measure that you needed to measure that mass spectrometry might be able to do? How could we make a mass spectrometer do that? And then if a new analysis concept came along, something like electrospray ionization, how could we utilize that to apply to these characterization challenges? 
And so you had people at the laboratory or other laboratories that were also BES funded uh, that would either come in with those problems or those analysis concepts or want to test the prototype systems that we might come up with. And so we kind of spun this innovation cycle, right? But it wasn't till the early 2000s that we really started to worry about patenting anything, maybe copywriting software. But once we could do that, then we were able to bring in outside industry who was interested in, in making these products. And they would either give us those pre-production prototypes or finished products back for us helping our infrastructure. We only had so much money from DOE to fund our infrastructure. How could we get other infrastructure from other resources? So chemical industry or the mass spectrometry industry funnel that back into our system. And then they're also working with uh, other industries that need mass spectrometry systems. So for example, the big mass spectrometry companies that we work with, like SIEX, for example, is working with all of the big pharma. The big pharma also want to test out what we're doing. So they can come in, give us, give us uh, problems to look at, but also funding through different means that the laboratory had, whether it was our cooperative research and development agreements or other sources of funding. And so now we didn't have to spin this cycle by ourselves. We could spin it with different industries and that would supplement uh, both the instrumentation and the funding uh, for our groups. And this allowed me to grow, right? And I could not have done that if we had not brought in these outside entities. And so this kind of, even though this kind of vision of, of a larger mass spectrometry center at Oak Ridge kind of went away. I was able to grow our program uh, with others through this, this industry collaboration effort. Uh, and then again, in the early 2000s or so, uh, what was called Partnership Cinema, it's probably called something else now, uh, really helped us because people, there was, a, there was an infrastructure to help us patent, help us license, and that did not exist uh, in the 90s and before. Right? That didn't mean it didn't happen, but it was much more difficult. Now, in 2018, uh, that money from BES went away. They did, the Department of Energy decided that was no longer something they wanted to fund. Fortunately, I was in a situation where I could spin that, that circle that was normally spun by BES funding myself and continue these collaborations. And that's what I'm still doing today. Right? And there's some advantages to it. Uh, if you work in the DOE system, uh, they have certain issues that they're worried about and others they're not. I didn't, no longer had that restriction. I could work on anything that we found interesting, right? And of course, a much lower cost of doing business. So um, even though I'm not working at the same pace, uh, I'm doing very similar, similar type of work uh, that I was before. Okay, with that as kind of an introduction as to how I got into inventing and why, uh, let's talk about what mass spec is in just at least one slide, okay? So generic mass spectrometry systems has many components. You've got to get a sample into it. You've got to make a gas phase ion out of that sample. You've got to mass analyze it, which means separate it by some means based on mass to charge ratio and then detect it, right? So there are a number of ways to, uh, enter a sample into the mass spec. Uh, normally you've got to clean it up. You, it's not uh, the CSI type thing to take a sample and you just stick it in the instrument. That usually doesn't happen. There's some kind of prep, knowing what you have to detect, what the matrices are. You have to have some kind of cleanup and then you have to introduce the sample. That's normally done by some kind of chromatography method or a flow injection method. Um, so GCMS uh, for small molecular weight uh, volatile species. Uh, LCMS, liquid chromatography for more polar, non-volatile uh, type species. There may be some kind of chemistry after that separation to help uh, identify the molecule by some kind of ionization or uh, derivatization process or whatnot. And then an interface. An interface. Uh, if you're doing liquid chromatography, you've got to get rid of the solvent. If you're doing gas chromatography, the, the material has to be in the gas phase. And then you've got to ionize it. Um, and that could be electron ionization, 
which is a, a still a, it's a traditional ionization technique used with gas chromatography, but then newer techniques like electrospray or atmospheric pressure chemical ionization and others, which are done in a liquid uh, uh, matrices. And then the mass analyzer, the one you choose here is kind of dependent on what you want to do. Uh, there are nominal mass instruments, uh, there are high uh, mass resolution instruments, there are instruments that can do something called tandem mass spectrometry that allows you to get more structural information on a molecule. Uh, if you want to quantitate versus qualitatively identify different types of mass analyzers. So you have all of these separation techniques, all of these ionization techniques, all of these mass analyzers give you multiple options to solve the problem at hand. And for what we were doing, we were, at, we were working on all of these, but I was working mainly on the front side of things. But what do you get? What do you get when you do mass spectrometry? So you get a picture something like this. If you do some kind of chromatography, you have a signal versus time. Uh, the signal here is, is related to the amount of material present. And then you have a mass spectrum at each point in time, right? And this mass spectrum are, is made up of mass to charge ratios of the species that are in these particular elution peaks. Now, if you're doing something like electron ionization, most of this is fragmentation. And you can identify the molecule based on those fragmentation patterns. If you're doing something like electrospray, you're mainly making uh, the intact molecular species, protonated, deprotonated, a sodium attached, something like that. And so there's not a lot of structural information, but you're getting the intact molecular mass. That can be hard to do with something like electron ionization. And that's where a technique like tandem mass spectrometry comes into play, because now you can take that intact molecular species, break it into pieces, and from the pieces, determine what the structure of the molecules are. So this is what happens. You've got a, a molecule, you've got to maybe clean it up. You introduce it into the mass spectrometry, either directly in the gas phase or in a liquid phase. Ultimately, it's into the gas phase by an electric field or uh, heating, and then it's ionized. You have to have an ion in the gas phase to do mass analysis, okay? Okay, so all of the research that I did uh, uh, at ORNL was on the front end of the mass spectrometer, getting the sample in and ionizing it. There's a little more history there um, because I was in a group that had two very good uh, mass spectrometers, gas phase ion chemists, in, Gary Glish and Scott McLucky. They didn't need another gas phase ion chemist. What they needed was someone to make them ions to investigate. So I worked on making the ions, they worked on analyzing the ions. So it was a division of labor type thing, but that's history now. So I ended up working on this end of things. Electrospray was the first thing I worked on, but then simplifying this front end. How can you make this more simple, uh, fast, um, easier to use by the non-expert? For example, if you wanted to go into a clinical uh, place with a mass spectrometer, you can't have someone working up the sample. It's got to be just shoot it in and get an answer out. That doesn't exist. And that's what, what people wanted um, and, and still people want today and we're, and we're all working. So simplifying this front end. Now, the other thing that was happening, we, I mentioned early on with P. Todd and secondary ion mass spec, there's something called mass spectrometry imaging that was coming along. If, if you want to look at a surface of some kind or you wanted to analyze a material directly, uh, I don't want to dissolve it, uh, put it in, the, in liquid, uh, nebulize it, ionize it. I just want to look at it directly. How could I do that? If I've got a tablet of some kind, is, for today, is that fentanyl, right? Uh, I have a, an affinity array of some kind, some kind of separation medium for proteins or thin layer chromatography plates, or I have a tissue section or I'll have my finger and I wanna analyze, see what's on my finger. Am I excreting a particular metabolite or um, a drug metabolite? How would you do that? So we ended up getting into a, how can we analyze surfaces directly with mass spectrometry? So here uh, is a prelude to that is kind of a typical electrospray ionization system. You have a capillary held at high voltage, a liquid's pumped through it, it can be pneumatically nebulized, so there's a gas flowing through here. Ends up making charged droplets. This is held at high voltage versus counter electrode. 
Now these charged droplets uh, desolvate, evaporate solvent in the gas phase. And by one or more different mechanisms, the charge, charges leaving the droplet or the droplet leaving the charges, uh, you end up with gas phase ions. Now, normally what you've done is dissolved your, 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 your analyte of interest in a solution, pumped it in or injected it in through a valve. Question is, how can you get this in to the electrospray in a more direct fashion without having to work up the sample like that? And so the thing that I uh, worked on uh, ended up being, I ended up calling open port sampling interfaces. And so the simplicity of these is, is the real beauty. So these are coaxial flow, continuous flow tube systems. So you have a, two tubes, in the annulus between the two tubes, a liquid flows up or up and down or in between. And then the center tube is connected directly to the ionization source of the mass spectrometer. Uh, the pneumatically assisted electrospray example acts as a, as a Venturi pump that pumps that liquid right in. So anything that touches this liquid gets sampled into the mass spectrometer. Now you can touch something physically to it. You can capture things like from a laser ablation experiment. You can drop liquids into it. Any kind of aerosols can be captured into it. So it can be a contact or non-contact system, and it can work with any kind of liquid introduction system. So we talked about electrospray, could be atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. Uh, for those of you that know elemental analysis and ductually coupled plasma, for example. Uh, and you can configure it in different ways, different sizes, different flow rates, different size tubes, the, the spacing between the tubes to do different types of things. And in the literature, there's lots of names for this. Surface sampling probe, liquid microjunction surface sampling probe, open port, open port interface, whatnot. But these are all open port sampling interfaces. Okay. Now what I'm gonna do is talk about some of the commercialized devices based on these and how they work. Okay. But here's, here's kind of the last primer for this, again, two coaxial tubes, uh, liquid pumped in, liquid aspirated to the mass spectrometer. If you balance this flow, you'll get a situation where you can touch this down to a surface and sample. If you overflow, so the flow into the mass spectrometer stays the same, but you up the flow through this annulus, the excess just pours over the top. That's a self-cleaning type system. Uh, again, you, you can touch it, uh, to anything, but it cleans itself. And so that has advantages. And then there's a vortex mode where you actually are sampling, uh, you're pumping less liquid than the system can aspirate. And so you get a little air capture. It creates some novel transport properties, a very high throughput type system uh, for a high throughput uh, analysis that we'll, we'll talk about. So just a very simple system, but changing the tube slightly, changing the flow rates gives you a lot of versatility, right? But there's no moving parts. Uh, that, that's what makes it really nice and robust. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about three systems today. Uh, they are commercial, uh, commercialized from this IP portfolio at, at ORNL. So the first will be this flow probe, uh, the next will be this touch express and the final one will be the echo. So early 2000, uh, I actually got a lot of this work funded um, by laboratory directed research uh, funding. Um, and this was what we call the liquid microjunction surface sampling probe. And the idea here was to sample affinity arrays uh, for protein identification. But anyway, that morphed on. We had, we won an award for that, an RD100 award, and we did some, some other modifications to it, but it ended up being commercialized for Prosali in 2013. So here's a little movie from Prosalia that talks about how this works, or it doesn't talk, shows how it works. Let me change the other one. Now this is what's called a plug and play system. So it can be made to go on any mass spectrometer.
So this is that liquid microjunction surface sampling probe right here in an electrosprobe. It shows the two coaxial tubes making what we call a liquid junction to the surface. So anything that's soluble in that liquid will be extracted from the surface and directly uh, infused right into the mass spectrometer. And in this case, using electrospray ionization. It's nice because the software allows it to be a point and click analysis type system. Just choose the spot you want to go to and the instrument goes. Ion current versus time and the resulting mass spectra at a particular point in time. An instrument like this can also do imaging and imaging is just a spatial location uh, the previous spot sampling is often called profiling, but now we're going to line scan across. And if you just put close line scans together, uh, you get an image. This looks to be uh, a mouse, whole body mouse thin section, animated. But so the application here, for example, is uh, if you're drug, drug development, you're dosing an animal, you want to know where it goes in the animal and what metabolites are made in those various locations. Now, other people are using this for different things. For example, here's another tissue section uh, application where they're analyzing proteins uh, in tissues. Uh, here's an application where they're actually looking at live brain cells uh, and actually using uh, an electrical impulse to stimulate the brain. And then they're looking at, at uh, dopamine release in real time. So the tissue remains a lot, right? So in the old days with mass spectrometry, you couldn't put a live sample in the mass spectrometer. It's in a vacuum system. So these systems that are out in air sampling allow you to a much wider variety of things you can analyze. Here's another case where these are microbes in a micro titer plate, analyze them directly uh, to either look at what's being excreted or identify the particular organism. Again, the material stays alive uh, at, even after you analyze it. And that's some kind of unique capability that these types of liquid extraction interfaces uh, make possible. Okay, the next thing was introduced is just a variation on this. You see that we're kind of pointing the, uh, the liquid microjunction surface sampling system down towards a sample. If you just turn it over, uh, maybe change some of the dimensions, you get what we did call the open port sampling interface, which is just a variation of, of the liquid microjunction surface sampling probe. And this variation was then uh, commercialized by the company Advion uh, in 2018. So again, two coaxial tube systems. This is the prototype for that. Again, different flow rates allow different types of menisci on the top. Uh, overflowing system, for example, great to, for a continuous washing. This is an electrospray source on a particular commercial instrument Again, this allows you, it's a pneumatically nebulized system that creates a venturi pump to pull the liquid in. So you pump in with something like an HPLC pump or other simple pump, you aspirate it out with a mass spectrometer's uh, electrospray system itself. So it's very simple. Here shows actually the top of this system. And so you have a continuous liquid flowing in this annulus region here, there's the outer tube, an inner tube, it's pouring over, kind of looks like your sink drain, right? So this is in this over aspiration area. If you up the flow rate, this meniscus changes. You'll see as that happens, you'll get a kind of a, a dome on the top here. 
So the liquid's still going into the mass spectrometer, but now you have a dome and this is pouring over continuously washing uh, the top of this probe. And here's another movie to show this happen. So here's this same system, a different inner tube. Here's the annulus. This is a, a peak tube now. For reference, this hole is 178 micron. So this is several millimeters across here. What I'm gonna do is touch an ink pen to this flowing liquid. So the liquid is not only going into the mass spec, but it's also pouring over the top here. You can see that, right? So it's continually washing. So you don't wanna to get too much sample in, you don't wanna contaminate your injection system, right? Boom, flows in, washed out. So if you look at this again, see the ink vortexing into the mass spec, just like your sink drain, uh, what's not pulled in is washed out quickly. Okay? So what ends up happening is you get very nice flow injection peaks without any carrier. And that's very difficult to do without kind of some kind of precise measuring devices. But you can change the flow rates and the tubing sizes here so that it's almost impossible to over, uh, to put too much uh, sample into the system. And this is just a case here where this is a melting point capillary, or just a closed gas blast capillary put into different cooking oils taken from the store and then touched down to this open port. And you see the, the peak for olive oil and soybean oil, and then distinctive mass spectra from each. And we wrote a paper that showed you could tell the difference between every oil they had at Kroger uh, by, by doing this kind of thing in just a few seconds. And that's a difficult thing to do. If you try to make up a sample with these oils, flow inject them or infuse them into a mass spectrometer, your tubing gets so contaminated so quickly because these, these are very difficult to wash out these oils. So, but with this system, it's, it's not an issue at all. Here's just another example here. We've taken two people from the laboratory and these are tape strips that are used for skin sampling. One person's a coffee drinker, the other is not, or a caffeine consumer. If you just put these tape strips on, on a person's skin for a few minutes, pull them off then touch them to the top of that open port and you look for caffeine and you look for the major metabolite of caffeine, just the intensity tells you how much is there. And this tells you that subject number one was the, the coffee user, right? And so this also relates to say, I wanna monitor uh, uh, drug use, whether it's uh, medication or illicit, uh, you, you often excrete this through your skin and people will say, well, you know, I, I didn't, I just came in contact with a coffee drinker, right? Well, it's the metabolite that tells you, no, no, you were actually the drinker, not just, just, just coming in contact with someone that was drinking coffee. And so here is the commercial instrument uh, based on, uh, from Advion, based on this, this simple open port sample. Touch Express open port sampling interface is designed for simple sampling of surfaces, solids, liquids, and sample preparation tips and fibers. Paired with the electrospray ionization source of the expression compact mass spectrometer, Touch Express incorporates an open port of a continuous, low flowing volume of solvent directly into the mass spectrometer. Solvent is delivered to the open port sampling area through a pair of concentric tubes. The solvent forms a meniscus at the open port before being drawn down the outer tube into the ion source of the mass spectrometer under the Venturi effect of the nebulization gas in the ion source. No sample preparation is required. Any soluble material touching the port is analyzed by the mass spectrometer in less than 30 seconds. The continuous flow of solvent creates a self-cleaning sample interface with zero carryover. Touch Express offers compound ID and impurity detection from almost any surface. Liquids and solids can be analyzed in a number of different ways. The system also allows for direct assays from sample preparation tips and speedy fibers. This sample interface is ideal for easy screening and drug research, food safety, 
environmental and forensics applications, as well as large molecule applications, including proteins, peptides, oligonucleotides, and polymers. Touch Express offers a fast assay benchtop solution for solids, liquids, and surfaces in a small footprint, easy to use system. Find out more at advion.com. And they have a couple of application notes on, on their website with fentanyl and urine uh, and looking at intact protein. So it, it's a simple system. And, and when I look at that, I don't know if there's any organic chemists online here, but this is the kind of thing where I just need to know what this might be. I need a quick check or, you know, it's a portal type system. I'm letting people through. I'm checking things quickly. There's no time for sample prep or I don't need any. I just need a kind of a yes, no uh, answer as, as to what this stuff, uh, how much there is and, and maybe what it is kind of thing. And then finally, I'm going to talk about here the ECHO uh, MS system, which is, as we talked about here, the liquid microjunction surface sampling probe was a balanced flow meniscus. The open port sampling interface was this overflow meniscus. And the ECHO is based on using the open port sampling interface in an over aspiration or a liquid vortex mode, right? So three commercial devices just using a different flow rate in these coaxial tubes. So what we're going to do with the with the uh, the echo type system is actually capture a droplet uh, into the open port, and we're, it uses this kind of over aspiration type situation, right? And these droplets are going to be in the neighborhood of two and a half nanoliter droplets. Okay. So what it uses is an acoustic droplet, droplet ejection device. These were developed uh, a number of years ago uh, for sample transfer. So if you are a person that makes affinity arrays uh, of different types, or if, if you've got a sample you wanna put down in a particular location in a very small volume, these devices were made for that. Uh, LabSite was a company that that, that did that. There was another commercial company that did it as well. So they, they, they use sound waves, focus the energy of the sound waves on the liquid surface. You can eject a droplet, very accurate volume. Right? And what we're gonna do is take this open port sampling interface, it's turned upside down over the top, captures this droplet up into the liquid and then transfers into the mass spectrometer. So this is that commercial system. You have uh, an X, XY stage that's computer controlled, say a 384, 1536 micro titer plate, ejecting a nanoliter droplet, one every second. Uh, those droplets are actually diluted during this trans transfer. So that allows you to actually look at very dirty samples on this side without any kind of sample cleanup. Big Pharma finds a big use for that. Uh, but anyway, very quick, uh, very easy to do. Uh, type of interface. So again, the acoustic droplets and non-contact uh, type of interface, very small volumes, open port dilutes, and then you've got the mass spec uh, for detection. So this is just a short video that shows you the speed. So this is a, looks like a 384 well plate. It's ampli sampling at three hertz. So every individual well is one third of a second. So three seconds, it can pass over uh, in one second, it passes over three, three wells, and it's taking data while it's doing it. So this is the speed of the analysis. I mean, this is unprecedented until the last couple of years being able to analyze samples this quickly with mass spectrometry. So what happens is if you're in big pharma, you'd normally read off plates optically uh, to get these kinds of speed. But an optical plate reader, and here you see the real-time kind of readout, an optical plate reader means you have to develop technology for color metric type detection. And that can also screw up the analysis. So this is a label free way to get the speeds that a plate reader would normally have. And so Big Pharma is incorporating these in their workflow. So this is the kind of peak shapes. This is one a second, right? Uh, look at less than 2% deviation over 384 well plate, two and a half nanoliter droplets. Uh, you can get down to nanomolar uh, type detection limits. That's not as good as you can do with LCMS, but it's often good enough and it's still very, very good. Um, 
There's no carrier, right? So this system washes it out. This is inject a sample, inject a blank, inject a sample, inject a blank. So that's, that's really, really nice. You can change the volume. And the way you change the volume is not the volume of the drops, but you quickly uh, eject 2.5 milliliter droplets so uh, that it ends up being a, a larger volume. So one to 10 drops very quickly, you can get a, a kind of a linear uh, response. You can also do a single drop or you can get a continuous infusion type system infusing at about or uh, putting the droplets in at about 10 hertz. So if you have a new compound or something you want to analyze over an extended period of time, take tandem mass spectrometry, you can do that as well. But even over a minute, you use less than a microliter of solvent. So it's, it's, it's very uh, nice that way for precious samples. Uh, you can also do things like proteins. So this is an antibody here. This is just to show you that this isn't only a small molecule type thing, but uh, tends to uh, hundreds of kilodaltons as well. This is just different molecules, detergent, not detergent, just showing that you get the same signal levels, whether the sample has a lot of uh, detrimental matrix or not because of this dilution. So again, papers published in this, largely big pharma uh, for high throughput analysis. And I, I'm just going to quickly touch on one application. So when this was licensed, and I don't have any real knowledge of the uh, specifics of the licensing, but it was envisioned that this would be sold to big farm. There's about 10 big, big farm. And you can imagine maybe they have 10 of these apiece in an ideal situation, all right? So that's maybe 100, 100 units. And then there's another 10 pharma uh, below that and they might have it. So there's maybe a couple hundred and then everybody and their brother, there may be two to 300 of these units sold. But then other applications come along that, that kind of dwarf that were completely unexpected, right? So this is something that's coming out of the UK or European Union, and, and you might expect it in the United States at some point. But if you're, if you're breeding chickens to lay eggs, uh, when you do that and those hens are laying eggs, you don't want to incubate the males. It's just a waste of energy uh, because you're going to throw them away in the end. In fact, you're going to chop them up for kind of feed for something else or fertilizer. So uh, you, you don't want to do that. What you want to do is identify uh, the females early on in the process. Now, there's probably lots of different ways you can do this. In the old days, you cameled eggs and things like that, right? So uh, here, you, want, you have to be able to do it before nine days uh, because that's when the chicken uh, knows you're doing something to it, the nervous system develops. So you have to be able to uh, kill them off uh, before nine days if you don't want the males. So there's worldwide, this was a number a couple of years ago, 6.5 billion male chicks are culled, right? That's half of the half of those eggs that are hat or that are laid, right? So in Europe, what's happening is animal, animal ethics laws are driving ways to identify early on whether you have a male or female, right? And also cost savings. If you have to incubate them all the way to hatching, that, that costs you money, right? So they need to sex these eggs early. So um, this company, Inovo, came up uh, with a biomarker in, in the egg uh, that they could, uh, they could tell the male from the female as early as nine days uh, from the, the egg being laid. They also came up with a, a robotic system to take a sample from the egg. So they have to pierce the egg, take some fluid out, seal it back up so it can hatch again. And then the echo mass spec system is used to uh, detect that biomarker, right? So this system is being used in this, this uh, chicken egg sexting in, in Europe right now. So here's the biomarker. It's greater in males than females. There's a cutoff line. It's not absolutely perfect, but if you measure the amount of this material relative to an internal standard, you have a very good chance of identifying male versus female at nine days or at nine days uh, post laying. So here's the data from the internal standard. Pretty nice, stable signal. Here's from the biomarker. So it's going up and down because we're this is male, female, male, female. So you look at the statistics, there's this cutoff when the ratio is about 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25
Everything above it's a male, everything below it's a female. And the, the, the accuracy is about 98%. And if they do this with PCR, they get about the same kind of accuracy, right? And they can analyze one sample a second, right? So here's the, here's the thing that's interesting, right? I'm gonna make up some numbers here, but these are based on what, you know, experience, but I really don't know what the licensing uh, with the lab is, but this is this is a good chance it's close to this. So again, I said a couple hundred instruments would be sold a big farm, right? And that's a that's a pretty big deal. Uh, but if you look at this, you've got 13 billion eggs you need to screen, right? Uh, each of these current these instruments that are currently configured can do 1,800 eggs an hour. If they run seven days a week, eight hours a day, every day of the every week of the year, you can do five times ten to the six per instrument. If you do the math, you need 2,600 instruments to analyze every egg, right? Okay, that's 10 times the number of instruments that you thought you might use in big pharma. Okay, these instruments aren't cheap. So it's about a mass spec for the mass, the mass spec part alone. That's 2.6 billion. Now people are considering this and actually doing it. So you know there's a lot of money in eggs, right? <laughs> All right, so here's some assumptions. Let's say that 10% of the value of the instrument, this $1 million instrument, is the IP that relates to this open port. And that's probably about right, but I don't, I don't have any proof for that. And then assume that 5% royalties collected on that for each instrument sold. If you do that math, it comes out to $13 million in royalties. Right? Those kind of numbers are, are kind of unprecedented. But what's important here is, not what these numbers are, is the fact that this application was not ever in anybody's imagination before this kind of stuff was invented, right? Uh, and these types of numbers are, are great for the lab and people that are doing the same type of thing that I was doing when I was there, because these, this money rolls back into uh, tech transfer or partnerships or whatever they're being called today to help fund people that were doing what I were doing too give them money to get initial IP off the ground, do more research, right? So this is why you do this internally at the laboratory because it feeds back in and helps that fund that cycle that I was spinning, right? Uh, to thrive, not just survive uh, at the lab. And there's many other things that could be applied to this. Uh, and we're hoping there's more products. Now I gotta finish up here. So I'm gonna whiz through a couple of things quick. Uh, so what else am I doing here? Okay, so COVID. We all talk about COVID. Unfortunately, we're still talking about it. And you can find lots of papers. And, and what people are, are worried about is the quality of indoor air. So COVID, uh, different ways of transmit, but through airborne indoor air is, 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 is a real issue. So clean up, clean up indoor air, right? Many ways to do that. Filtration. Uh, if you've got surfaces, surfaces are going to be more of an issue uh, for things like monkey pox, for example. Uh, but uh, purific other purification technologies in the gas phase, UV technology, a lot of hospitals were using UV lights to clean up space. And then there are people that are using ionizers, right? And you'll see, in this case, bipolar ionizers, but it doesn't have to be bipolar, but different types of ionizers. When I hear that as a mass spectrometrist, that tweaks my interest. Right. So ionizers are used in HVAC systems. They've actually been done in different forms or fashion for a long time. Use high voltage electrodes to make ions in the air. Right. And the jury can still be out on what they do or don't do, uh, but they, they are known to enhance filtration systems. So high voltage ionizers uh, making ions in the gas phase right, at atmospheric pressure. Well, if you go online, you can find multiple types of ionizers. And uh, in the old days, uh, you'd see these uh, and you knew you had an ionizer because you could smell the ozone, right? Uh, they don't all make ozone. Some do, some don't, uh, but they're great at cleaning up smoke, for example. So a smoker would have these to hide, hide the odor from smoke or, the, or even the smoke itself. Now here's a case where Oak Ridge, $7.4 million contract for an air system in the high school uh, the proposed air purification system is a needle point bipolar ionizer. Okay, this was in uh, February 20, uh, 22nd, 2021. 
Okay, and it apparently Anderson County has some of these and in different different locations as well. Okay, so this passed. I don't know if it was installed or not, but I remember reading about it. A month later, here's an open letter on the internet from a prominent group of scientists. I do know Kim Prather, who's an atmospheric, uh, an aerosol chemist out, out in California. And what they said was, we appealed the school district facility managers to recognize the unproven nature of many electronic air uh, cleaning devices. As they are unproven, it's critical to avoid wasting valuable emergency COVID relief and dollars install, installing them within school district facilities. So there's a little controversy as to whether these are good investments or not. And this is right in our own backyard. Well, that piqued my interest, right? So another thing is there are papers out there that say, you know, these air ionizers, they don't only not clean up the air, they make stuff that's worse. So what is the real story? What ion chemistry really happens when and why with these ionizers? So here's, Here's, here's your indoor air or your outdoor air, right? Oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and a few other things. You got a high voltage electrode. Uh, if it's in positive, if it's a positive potential on it, you're gonna ionize some things, make different things. Uh, what, ha what really happens? Well, some of it could be good. Some of it could be bad. It depends on the exact situation. But as a mass spectrometer, this is a unique, interesting problem. So this whole type system is actually the, the uh, part of what's normally an atmospheric pressure chemical ionization source, medically nebulized, vaporized, ionized by a corona discharge system into a mass spectrometer. So I know this, this infrastructure, I have this infrastructure, you can use this infrastructure to study this, this ion chemistry uh, in the gas phase for these indoor air cleanup systems. It's well known that you're in a normal atmosphere, that uh, you end up with, say, protonated water clusters in positive ion mode, negative ion mode, uh, other type systems. Proton affinities dictate what you ionize, but you just, you it's proton transfer chemistry mainly, not destruction of any uh, analytes. But of course, life's not that simple. In negative ion mode, you make other species, there can be other reactions. So anyway, one big part of my work right now is studying what ion chemistry is taking place with different types of ionizers that are used to clean up air. And I think it's, it's relevant to us all uh, because a lot of money is being spent uh, and people's, people's lives, in fact, are, are at stake. And then the one thing I'm just gonna finish with is I said a shift of physics here for Bob, basically. Uh, back in the day, uh, I threw the shot and the discus, and of course, you got a simple projectile and an airfoil. So there's some physics, some simple physics involved here, more simple physics with the shot than the discus. The discus is a little more complicated, but I had a background in this and I really loved it. Uh, and I had the opportunity uh, to work uh, with a number of throwers in Oak Ridge and particularly with the high school recently. Uh, and yes, some of them uh, I knew pretty well. So uh, my oldest daughter, uh, was, a, was pretty good, um, made it to the statement a couple times. Uh, second farthest discus thrower for a girl in, in Oak Ridge history. Uh, so that was really nice. Last year, we brought another person to the state meet, Trent Howe. Uh, if you go to Honey Baked Ham, you'll see uh, Trent working uh, at, at the <laughs> counter there. All state in 2021. And then this year, uh, my youngest daughter uh, made it to state and was uh, the Oak Ridge female athlete of the year. And so, with these pictures here, actually, you see the core of, of, of Van Burko Ventures. But I have to say that, you know, <laughs> being able to volunteer coach, uh, you know, has been one of the more satisfying things I've done in, in retiring and allowed me the time to do it. And, uh, you know, given the demographics on this talk, maybe it's grandchildren or whatever, but I highly recommend the throws and track. You know, uh, Bob likes the jumps, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, Put it my way. I'd love to. I'd love to work with as many people as I can. I love track and field. Um, so this is what I'm going to finish here. Lessons learned. When attempting to patent and build an IP portfolio, persevere. Right? Everybody likes letters like this. 1992 from DOE, the first patent application I ever put in. DOE patent application not warranted due to insufficient limited use and analytical tool and limited novelty. Well. 
14 years later, I won the Beeman Award for coupling electrochemistry with mass spectrometry and understanding the electrochemical aspects of electrospray and had a few other patents. But this was the day when it was very difficult to patent in Oak Ridge because there was no one to talk to. So that leads to the kind of separate thing. Personal relationships are critical to getting patenting and licensing done. In those days, uh, the patenting application went into a DOE black hole. And if it ever did come out, you never had any way to respond because you never knew how it happened. But that changed later on with the partnerships directory. And, that, and so knowing the people inside your organization involved in this and knowing the people who you're trying to license to or sell that patent to is important as well. Stay involved in the product development as close as you can. What I've seen happen with others and in our own uh, cases is the engineers engineer out the capabilities, the core capabilities of the device. So you have a pre-production prototype, the engineer comes by and makes it simpler. There's no longer a critical knob to be turned to make the system work. Um, first to market has an advantage. It doesn't have to be perfect. You can perfect it and protect it once you've got it out there. And in fact, it's the early adopters that are gonna to help to identify the new and interesting applications and maybe the most profitable, right? The Innovo chicken egg. So get it out there and let people start using it and, and you'll have more success. And if, and if you can avoid exclusive licensing in a single field of use and, and make sure that you hold all the licensees to legal milestones in the licensing agreement. That's, it's just business, right? I mean, it's hard when you've got friends involved in things, but you wanna get as, your product out there. You don't want it stuck on a shelf. So, so this business act, aspect of things is, is really, really important or it just slows things down. And you only, once you've got those patents, there's a, there's a time clock uh, clicking, uh, ticking. So you've got to get stuff out quickly. I like to play to win, not play to lose. So I'd like to get multiple things out there, uh, not have everything ideally protected, but just make things happen. Again, first uh, to have a product out has an advantage and score by racking up lots of single base hits versus a few home runs. So if you have many products out there, uh, it's more likely to be successful than just focus on one exclusive. So with that, I'm finished and happy to answer any questions. Sorry for taking so long, but thanks for your attention. Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, we have a, uh, a chat question. Um, I'll read that. Gary, my uncle, Seymour Meyerson was a chemist specializing in mass spectrometry at Stanford at Standard Oil of Indiana from 1946 to 1984. He would describe the work to lay persons as follows. Most chemists study the sociology of molecules. I study the psychology of molecules. Uh, I hope I, I have that the right way around. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, that's a little deep for me, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, mass, the world revolves around mass spectrometry. I mean, mass spectrometry is, is a real central uh, technique. And, and that's kind of the, um, what, what's dis what was, I hate to say this, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a friend of Ornell, but, was disappointing is mass spectrometry did nothing but grow and continues to just flourish. Uh, but it, it, the, it, it kind of went away from what it could have been at ORNL. And that's kind of, that's kind of disappointing. Uh, but, you know, dynasties come and go, right? So, I mean, someday UT is going to beat Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the, the, uh, I don't see any more chat questions, but if you uh, press your uh, space bar, you can, uh, you can ask one. I haven't heard any questions yet. <laughs> well, th this was fascinating. I can't think of any questions to ask. This is uh, just lots to think about. Well, one, of the oops, one of the questions that I, I would have is um, 
how many charges can you, well, on any droplet, presumably you, you can, the bigger the droplet, the more charges you, you can put on it. So in other words, if you don't, don't want to get confused with too many uh, 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 peaks for a given liquid, let's say a liquid droplet, I guess you have to go to a small, the, the smallest droplet that you can possibly find so you don't have this unlimited no, number of charges. I have no idea how many charges you can put on a droplet of a given size. Yeah, so this is, you guys should know this uh, better than me because there's something called the Rayleigh limit. So you, you can only put so many on before the columbic repulsion overcomes the, the ability for the, the droplet to stay together. So uh, what you're trying to do in the mass spectrometry experiment is actually get rid of all of the solvents. All right? So that's not confusing anything. And then the question becomes, how many charges can the, the molecule itself hold? And that's going to be a similar kind of situation. The molecule has a particular size. And so you can only, you have to space the charges apart as far as you can before the repul columbic repulsion overcomes the affinity of, of the charge for the molecule, right? And spits it off. Um, and then it also depends on, that depends on, you know, what kind of functional groups are on the molecule. So a protein, for example, in, in the positive ion mode, the protons uh, that ionize it are associated with the nitrogens. The nitrogens uh, are the more, more basic of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the atoms on the molecule. There's only so many of those. And then there's only so many of those spaced appropriately. So, but if you have a hundred kilodalton uh, protein, you can have tens of charges, say up to maybe 50 charges on that molecule. And what's interesting is this was what really first got Finn the attention from the general community is when he showed the multiple charging of proteins. And, and so what you ended up with was a distribution of, of ions in the gas phase, uh, same molecule, different number of charges. And you could look at the actual spacing of M over Z to determine how many charges were there up to some point. Uh, and then the mass, mass spectrometer didn't have enough resolution uh, past that point. But then you could do some algebra to figure out what the charge was on each, on each molecule. And so what that allowed you to do, many things that allowed you to do. First thing it allowed you to do is get those big things into the gas phase that, that charge helped liberate those from the drop, the, the liquid droplets. Uh, but a mass analyzer, say a uh, typical mass analyzer may only have an M over Z range of 1,000, 2,000. Not something like uh, Bob's time of flights, which might be unlimited, but as, as you go to higher and higher M over Z, the detection can be more difficult because they're moving slower in a time of flight. Uh, but you couldn't see a molecule if it didn't, if it was weighed 10,000 and had one charge on it, it was outside of your M over Z range. But if you have a 10,000 uh, Dalton protein and you put 10 charges on it, now it shows up at M over Z 1000 and you can see it. So that was, that was unbelievable in the late eighties that you could do this thing. It just opened up an enormous field of research in around large biomolecules. So that's a long-winded answer to a question about how many charges. I learned a lot from that that I've never thought about, but it's very interesting. Uh, we have a question from Carolyn Krauss. Have any ORNL technologies been commercialized to detect explosives in packages at airports? Uh, there have been many that have kind of been tested. Uh, someone like uh, Kevin Hart might know if they, they did anything else. Um, we never were able to successfully do things. We had thing, a thing called a boarding port pass analyzer, for example, that made a lot of post 9-11, you know, was on the TV and this kind of stuff. And frankly, did a great job, uh, a great job. Uh, but just never, never got a lot of, a lot of traction. So uh, they've been used internally, as I said, at Y12. Um, but I don't think there has been anything commercialized. I mean, there have been proven prototypes, but, but nothing that's ever been sold. 
Okay, uh, we have a, qu uh, a question uh, from Joyce. Have you been involved in any nuclear proliferation detection appl uh, application? Uh, and in, in, uh, in parentheses, detecting trace amounts of nuclear materials in the environment. No, I've not been, but there is still uh, a, a group at ORNL that, that that is their mission. So, um, you know, again, talking about who talked last year, uh, Kevin Hart would be the guy that could point you in that direction. Uh, I'm not sure who's running that group, but that is, that is their sole mission. So everybody remembers the mouse house that was not the one that was torn down at Y12, the one that was built at X10 to replace that. Well, soon after that, they decided, DOE decided, we don't care about that kind of work. And that, that facility was made to be a really clean facility, right? Because part of the problem with the mice was they were getting sick and all that kind of stuff. That facility was um, transformed into a trace element facility, ultra trace. And it's used in the non-proliferation arena. That's, that's the work they do. I don't see any other type questions. Are there any other questions that you would like to enter? Gary, uh, this is Chuck Crouton. Uh, I was curious to know when you were at the lab, what percentage of the work that was going on in mass spec was to help other programs at the lab versus developing the techniques or uh, new techniques? And I, the reason I say that is it. The computer analogy, the, the lab has gone whole hog on developing fast computers. And yet I think, as I understand it, there's still difficulty getting help in, in with getting computer programs for the, re, the researchers at the lab. Yeah, no, that's a point well taken. I think it's, I think it's a similar analogy. Uh, I don't know the exact cause. I mean, we all used, one excuse just to be money. Um, you know, you didn't have, you, you had resources that were dedicated to your mission and anything outside of that, you, you were, you wanted to do that. You saw me how I spin that wheel, right? Um, it's this thing right here. So these BES collaborators, this could be anybody at the lab that had a need. But ultimately, uh, you know, because of limited resources, this, this stuff didn't happen as often as it, as it should. So the synergy with other groups at the lab uh, was not as good as it, it could be, absolutely. Um, and I, it is just limited, just limited resources. Plus we had to answer, we always had to be at DOE based basic energy sciences, we had to be having the next new big thing, not just analyzing someone's sample. So in order to survive, we, we had to be doing this kind of innovative stuff. So if, if I analyzed your sample and you won the Nobel prize for it, I could still lose my job because it, I didn't do anything novel. I just used the mass spectrometer the way it was meant to be used. Are there any other questions? Um, Herb, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, let me make a, a comment about uh, the mass spectrometry there at, at ORNL. There was a collaboration with, between uh, myself and Bob Hedick, who uh, Gary mentioned earlier. He was in analytical chemistry there. Uh, Bob uh, had a beautiful FTMS, Fourier transform mass spectrometer that you could do laser desorption. And uh, he and I discovered, along with Rufus Ritchie to do the theory, we discovered the first uh, multiply charged negative ion, at least uh, from a physics point of view. And, and it, it, it happened that uh, it, when you put one electron on, on the carbon 60 molecule, the C60, you have a bound state. You bring up the second one, it's, an, it's not stable anymore, but there's a Coulomb repulsion, a barrier for putting that electron on. Once it's on there, it can't get out. So that's called a Coulomb barrier to uh, ejection. And it, the more you put on, the bigger that barrier gets. So that's what allows these negative ions of multiply charged negative ions 
to actually exist. And uh, we sort of made a, <laughs> I made sort of a career out of out of that, thanks to Bob Hedick and and his FTMS there at the lab. A lot of core, a lot of collaborations. You could just back in my day, you could collaborate with anybody, and and I did so. And as you know well, there at the Tandem Machine. But uh, yeah, I don't know how it's like out there now. But by the way, I think Kevin Hart is either a retiring or retired. I I, I talked to him recently. It's on the way out, I think. That's right. Yeah. But thank you. Okay, Bob. Uh, are there any other uh, questions or comments? Just a comment that I hope by the end of the week we have all four of those slots in the virtual science club filled. <laughs> With that, I guess we will uh, we will adjourn the meeting and thank our speaker for uh, for an enlightening talk. It was interesting. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Gary. Well. Thanks, Gary.